Welcome, welcome, welcome. In this video, we're going to discuss the game of Nim. The game of Nim is probably one of the oldest games in the world. So how does it work? So you place counters. You don't necessarily have to play nine counters, but in this example below, that's where we're going to start. So nine counters are shown. The players take turns removing counters, provided that the counters are all in the same horizontal row. So if you look up the game of Nim, sometimes uh, people describe this game in piles or heaps. The way that we're going to do that idea in this lecture is to have horizontal rows. So one pile is this horizontal row. The next pile is that horizontal row. And the final pile is the third horizontal row. So the player that picks up the last counter wins the game. So the player that makes the last move of the game will win the game. And our job is to figure out, as usual, in two-player games, who can always win the game. So once again, you take turns, taking counters. You can take whatever you want as long as it's from the same horizontal row. You could take all four of them from the last row, or just that one and that one from the last row. Take whatever you want from the middle row on your turn or whatever you want from the first row on your turn. But you can only take from, from one row at a time on your turn. So give this a try. Play around with it a little bit. Then we'll analyze this game and then we'll get into a little bit deeper in the theory behind analyzing the game of NIM. Okay, so now let's get into a little bit more of a theoretical approach to this game, maybe rather than just trial and error type of analysis. So we're going to try to use our state diagram to deal with this problem, at least at first. We'll get into something more sophisticated later on. So we'll try to represent the game in a state diagram with three numbers at a time. So rather than drawing this type of picture over and over and over, we're just going to represent the game as having four in one pile, so that's what this four means, and then three in another pile, so that's what the three means, and then the two corresponds to the two. And we're going to try to stick with the strategy of pushing the larger numbers to the, the left-hand side. So the 4-3-2 game would technically be equivalent to like a 2-3-4 game. Either way, you have a pile of two, a pile of three, and a pile of four, but we're always going to push the larger number to the left-hand side so we don't repeat any you know, symmetric positions. Okay, so our state diagram is given below, and I guess it's not a complete state diagram, it's more of a, a partial state diagram. So from here, hopefully this can tell us who can always win the game. And we're going to try to analyze this state diagram with hot and cold positions. So if we look at the very end of the game, there's a pile of two or a pile of one, and the player that has two in front of them or one in front of them can win by playing from hot to cold. So the game ends in a cold position for this scenario. And we'll work backwards from here all the way back to 4-3-2. So let's start with the 1-1 one, one position. So in the 1-1 one, one position, there's really no choice. Just a pile of one or another pile of one. You can only take one. So that position would be cold. A player moving from cold to hot, there's nothing to do um, but that one choice, and there's no winning strategy to employ from there. So that position is cold. So every way of playing into that position is hot. So, you know, for example, if you play from 3, 1, 1, you can take the 3 and change it to 1, 1. In the next one, if it's 3, 1, you can change the 3 into a 1. If it's 2, 1, 1, you can take the 2 and leave 1, 1. And 2, 1, you could change the 2 into a 1. Now let's analyze the 2-2 two, two position. So if you have 2-2, two, two, both of the ways of playing from there are hot, and that means by definition that the 2-2 two, two position is cold. So now working backwards from the 2-2 two, two position, 3-2 is hot and 2-2-1 two, two, is hot. 
Okay, now we've arrived at a pretty important position for first analyzing the game of NIM, the 3, 2, 1 position. Let's remember what that looks like. So we have a pile of 3, a pile of 2, and a pile of 1. And is this position hot or cold? Let's try to think of all the different ways of playing the game from here. If you play on the first row, there's one choice. Just take one. If you play on the second row, there's two choices, take one or take two. If you play on the last row, there's three choices, take one, two, or three. So in total, you have one choice plus two choices plus three choices, six choices in total. And notice all six choices are listed below in our partial state diagram. And all six of those options are hot positions. So that means that the position that we're looking at is cold. This is a, a cold position. Or in our diagram, we'll put the blue box around 3, 2, 1 to represent that that's cold. So the 4, 3, 2 position can play into the 3, 2, 1 position by looking at the pile that has four. So the pile or row that has four, if you look at that row, you can decide, OK, we'll take three out of that row. And that will change the game into the 3, 2, 1 position. So from this position right here, going to you know, that position, we have a hot and cold move. So the 4, 3, 2 position is hot. And therefore, the first player can always win this game. OK, so that gives us the story for how you can play the game when you start with a row of four and a row of three and a row of two. What if there was a lot more rows or a random you know, distribution of counters in those rows? How would you analyze the game from there? So we can do that. We need a little bit more of a sophisticated tool. That's what we're going to start on next. So to come again with that comment, when analyzing the game of NIM with a small number of rows and counters, the partial state diagram is you know, a somewhat reasonable way of dealing with determining the winner. However, for a large number of rows and counters, we need something a little bit more sophisticated. So that's where this following definition is leading us to. So if we're given a list of whole numbers, we can define something called the NIM sum. So this might be brand new to you. This is a new way of combining numbers. It's a new operation. So don't think of it as regular addition or regular multiplication. It's a brand new way of operating on numbers. It's called the NIM sum. So how do we find this NIM sum? Well, we take our positive numbers and we represent them as different powers of two. So take every number you have and write it out as a sum of different powers of two. So five, for example, would be four plus one. We'll do some examples below. And then cancel every pair that you see of equal powers. Now it says every pair, so it's not every um, you know, triplet that you see. It's every time you see two of the same, every time you see two powers that are equal, then you cancel them out. And finally, you just add up what's left. That's how you calculate the NIM sum. So in mathematical notation, if this is our list of numbers, you write A1, and then we call this symbol the NIM sum. At least in this context, we call it the NIM sum. The symbol is also used for other you know, scenarios in algebra, or other scenarios in mathematics. But in this context, we're calling it the NIM sum. Some other context might call it the direct sum or, or something else, depending what you're using it for. So let's find some NIM sums. If we have two NIM summed with three, let's go through the steps. So the first thing that we do is write out the number as a bunch of different powers of two. So two is already a power of two. So nothing that we have to do there. Three is not a power of two. We can write that out as two plus one. Okay, now we cancel out any pairs of powers that we see. So there's two twos, they cancel out, and what you have left is one. 
Okay, so our next example, we have two, three, and four. So two is already a power of two. Again, the three, we can change it into two plus one to write it out as powers of two. And that gets nim summed with four. Four is already a power of two, it's two to the power of two. So from here, we cancel out any powers that we see twice. There's two twos, add up what's left, and we have five. So five is our answer this time. Okay, in the next example, we have 15 nim summed with 15. So 15 would be eight plus seven more. So seven would be four plus two plus one. And we're careful to put brackets around all of that because all of that is getting nim summed with 15 again. So eight plus four plus two plus one. Okay, let's remember the next step. It's to cancel out like powers. So if we see two eights, they cancel out. If we see two fours, cancel out. Two twos, cancel out. Two ones, cancel out. So what's left is nothing. This is a possibility as well. You can have your nim sum come out as zero. We'll never get a negative nim sum. But now we kind of see that, okay, in future, if we have two numbers that are equal and they're being nim summed together, maybe we don't have to go through all of these you know, steps that we just did. We could just look back and say, okay, 15 is nim summed with 15, and all the powers of two that are contained here are exactly all the powers of two that are contained here. So they will all cancel out. So if you wanted to, we could have maybe done this a little bit faster and got to you know, zero by just canceling out the 15s to begin with. All right, so in the next example, we've got 25 nim summed with 31. So 25, we'll write that as 16 plus eight, that would take us to 24, so we need one more. And then 31, would be 16 plus eight plus four plus two plus one. So any pairs that we see, two 16s, two eights, two ones, and we have four plus two left over, which gives us six as our answer. Okay, in the next example, we've got four, that's already a power of two, nothing we have to do there. And then we've got seven, so four plus two plus one, and then finally 12, which is eight plus four. Okay, so here we cancel out any pairs that we see. We see two fours. Remember to not cancel out that third four. So what's left is one plus two plus four plus eight. So this time we get 15 as our answer. Okay, so in the last example, we've got a bunch of numbers nim summed together. How about we use what we thought of above with the 15s? The 15s cancel out nicely for us, and we see some repeated numbers, like there's two sevens. So let's just save ourselves a bit of time, cancel those out right away. And the same thing with the 12s, we'll cancel those out right away. And maybe we can look above to see what we got for four and seven. Right, four and seven is right here. So it would just be two plus one left over. So that answer is three. Okay, so as a final note, before we uh, put this um, NIMSA sum uh, material kind of locked in our brains, let's think of some of the algebra that goes along with this. We've discussed some of these details already, but it's nice to have a, a lemma which collects everything in one spot for us. So what are some of the things that you should know about the nim sum operation? So if you take two numbers and you nim sum them together, you should always be getting a whole number. A whole number here is referring to either zero, one, two, three, or any bigger integer, not a negative number. And we have whole numbers to begin with. And as you may have guessed, we're gonna relate this to the game of nim. And in the game of nim, you don't have negative rows or no negative amounts in your heaps or piles. So it makes sense that we're dealing with whole numbers here. Okay, also we have a commutative property. So A and B commute, meaning that you know if they're commuting, you go you commute to work and then you commute 
back to work, you go back and forth, it doesn't matter which order. So A and B is the same as B and A when NIMSUM together. In the third property, we also see that the NIMSUM is what we call associative. So it has the associative property, which means you can move the brackets. The brackets could be on the A and the B, and they could move to the B and the C. And this makes sense because what you calculate with you know, the NIMSUM is canceling out powers of two, and then you do regular addition after. And regular addition is both commutative, you can switch the order with regular addition, and you can move brackets, so regular addition is also associative. So in that sense, these two properties do, do make sense. Okay, problem uh, part four. So you have a nim sum with a. Anytime you have the same number, you get zero, just like we did above with you know the two sevens and the two twelves. And then a final property: if you have different numbers, if a and b are not the same, then you'll never get zero. So you can't get all the powers of two canceling out. Okay, so thanks so much for listening to the introduction on nim and nim sums. In the next video, we'll move along to trying to analyze the game of NIM in a complete way. We'll come up with a theorem so that you can become a NIM master and always win the game. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you on the next one.